Brothers and sisters in the sure hope of Israel. Having considered the brethren's responsibility to love their wives last week, we'll consider this week, God willing, a sister's responsibility to submit to their husbands. So turn with me initially to Ephesians chapter 5, which will lead us to the fundamental principles being established in the Garden of Eden. And then, God willing, we'll reflect on how Peter and Paul builds on these elsewhere. And finally, consider some practical examples that arise. We'll also be considering how we ought to prepare ourselves for our marriage next week. So we'll try and avoid overlapping too much. And of course, these principles apply both in our marriages today and in our relationship for all of us with the Master as his prospective bride. So turn to Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 22, where our subject title seems to be taken from. And there we read, Wives, submit yourselves unto your husbands as unto the Lord. And verse 23 continues to explain, for the husband is the head of the wife. Even as Christ is the head of the ecclesia, and he is the saviour of the body, therefore as the ecclesia is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. The Ephesian background and environment would not have been without its significance for the epistle. Ephesus was effectively the capital town of Asia Minor and one of the four major cities of the Eastern Roman Empire. It would have been influenced by the wisdom and the learning, the thinking of the current Greek philosophy and the physically dominant pagan immoral temple of Diana that dominated the city from the hill that it resided upon. And perhaps since the temple was run purely by women priests, it gave rise for the need for Paul to remind the sisters for their need to submit to their husbands. And very importantly, in the words of chapter 3 and verse 19, uh, this was essential for the fullness of Christ to dwell within them. Uh, Like our environment, the Ephesian environment would have been rather unsavoury. And surely they, like we, would have appreciated the huge contrast between the things and the hopelessness of the world about them with the comfort, the love and the hope of the truth that we are blessed with. And sadly, our environment does affect us, even today to varying degrees, some more than others, such as human rights, women's rights, modernism, and more recently post-modernism, which suggests everyone is entitled to their own opinion, to express it, and everyone's opinion is equally right. It seems to me that Paul, in these very first few chapters, explains the hope that he has for his brethren and sisters. And then he addresses some of the issues that were affecting them as a result of their environment. Paul, therefore, through the Spirit, opens his epistle in chapter 1 and verse 2 with the very powerful words, Grace and peace to us, of all people. Through, as we mentioned before, chapter 2 and verse 13, the blood of the Lamb. What a depth of love that is, brothers and sisters, for us. Peace is the shalom. A deep peace in our hearts and minds now, through the comfort and the assurance of the word. But ultimately it speaks of the true eternal peace of the millennium. And then in chapter 3 and verse 14, he bows his knee, does Paul, in prayer. Uh, Verse 16, that we be, and he prays, that we be strengthened with might by his spirit in the inner man, 
that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth, the length and the depth and the height of that love. And to know the love of Christ, which passeth knowledge, that ye might be filled with all the fullness of God. How rich every word is. How powerful and full of meaning it is. It deeply profound words. And his prayer is that we all grow to the love and the fullness of God. And that Christ might dwell in our hearts. And in order for that love to dwell in its fullness in their hearts, he addresses many issues in the remaining three chapters of this epistle. And so by implication, appropriate submission within the ecclesia is an essential quality and characteristic for us to have. In order, he argues, for that fullness of God, and the mind of Christ to dwell within us. Paul, to my way of thinking, rather pertinently comments in Romans chapter 3 and verse 13. Romans chapter 3 and verse 13. For if ye live after the flesh, ye shall die. If ye through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, ye shall live. And he adds, if you go to Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And I'm sure you are all aware. Transformed has the root idea of metamorphosis, which is a complete change from one thing to another, like the changing of a grub to the beautiful butterfly, no longer having anything of the old body or form left. But notice the subtlety of his words. It is a process that Paul expects us to put in place. It does start with the renewing and the renovation of our minds and our moral behaviour. But it doesn't stop there. Hopefully it will affect our whole being, God willing, at the return of our Master. And it's clear from these words that Paul believed we do have a choice in these matters. A choice in the way we think, a choice in the decisions we make, a choice in the things that we do, our behaviour. And we can make the right ones, provided we have the right and appropriate understanding to know what is right. Back in Ephesians and chapter 5 and verse 21 through to chapter 6 and verse 9, makes what might appear to be a disproportionate large issue of us submitting one to the other. That's from chapter 5 verse 21 through to 6 verse 9. And in chapter 5 verse 21 and 22, the words to submit are the same root word in the Greek, which essentially means to set in order underneath one another. And Paul clarifies in what ways he expects this to happen by by providing a number of contrasts. The first in verse 22. Wives, submit to your husbands. Verse 24. In the same way that the ecclesia ought to the master. On the other hand, verse 25, husbands shall love their wives as the master loved the ecclesia in giving his life for them. And initially it might seem that Paul spends a disproportionate amount of time on the responsibility and the expectation of the husband. For it continues right the way through to the end of the chapter in verse 33. Verse 23, sorry, to the end of chapter, verse 33. Verse 23, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as the master is the head of the ecclesia. He is the saviour of the body. So we see that the husband was to be the head, in the same way that the master is to the ecclesia. 
It's rather different to the way that the world sees it, isn't it? And verse 24 does say in everything that the Greek word, and the Greek word does mean literally everything, anything, all things, the whole. Notice also that as the master was the saviour of the body, so should the husband be. Who should therefore who should therefore similarly provide for the spiritual deliverance of his wife and family, even to the giving of his life, as the master did? Again, isn't that something which should provoke some serious thought for our brethren? A point that I believe Brother David made very strongly last week. But let's turn to Genesis chapter 1 to 3, where Paul is deriving these principles. And where in fact, to my way of thinking, most if not all of scripture has its roots. In chapter 1 and verse 26, we find that God decides to make man, which includes, according to verse 27, both male and female. Verse 26, both were made in the image of the Elohim. Image implies the same visible form. And so we understand, interestingly, that they were therefore both male and female looking Elohim. They were also made in the likeness of the Elohim, which refers to their mental capacities. So they were both very similar to one another and to the Elohim, and both were equally able, able to absorb spiritual principles and to develop them, the same spirit mind in their, in their minds. It's rather obvious also that there is a difference between them, otherwise they wouldn't be described in that way. And notice there is also, there is also by implication an order between them, Otherwise, male, then female. Interestingly, a comment made before they came together in marriage, which was approved in verse 28. Verse 27 also indicates that they both share the same responsibility and dominion over the earth and all that there was therein. So we find that there are things that both male and female are equal in before the Father. But there are other, other things in which there is order. According to verse 31, both Adam and Eve were made on the sixth day. In chapter 2 and verse 7, we see that Adam was formed out of the ground. But in verse 18, we we find one of the principal reasons for marriage and why Eve was created in a different way. It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helpmeet. Help does mean help. But meat has the idea of companionship and something, something which is alongside or parallel or in a sense opposite in front of. And so she was to be a suitable companion, opposite, helping him in the responsibilities that the father had given him, that is Adam. Verse 21, Yahweh Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept, and he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which Yahweh Elam had taken from man made him a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So we see that Adam's companion was much more than just a mate. There was to be a special relationship between them. Having been formed from his bone and his flesh, out of the side of Adam, figuratively out of his heart. Eve was actually part of man. And she therefore by nature had a much closer empathy and dependency on Adam. And this of course ought to have been evident in their uh, and our marriages. 
But what, what can we deduce about the different natures and the different abilities of Adam and Eve in the garden? Who were formed with different roles in mind, as we've seen. Chapter 2, verse 15. Adam was asked to dress and keep the garden of Eden. In other words, to work within it and to guard, protect and develop it. And in type, given trees depict individuals, as is evident from Isaiah 55, for instance. There are many others as well. There is a spiritual implication that he was also responsible for building a family and bringing them up in the nature and the admonition of the truth. And we find this is borne out in chapter 1 and verse 28, when they are blessed and told to be fruitful, multiply, and to replenish or fill the earth, both physically with their own family and also spiritually by implication of the types. And so Adam was the firstborn of man, and was therefore king, and was, we'll see, priest, and I believe also prophet, but I'm not sure that we'll get there tonight. Eve would help Adam in all this, and she was his helpmate. And if she didn't voluntarily submit in this way, surely there would be some friction between them. And importantly, she would have been contradicting the father's instructions and his will on the matter. When we consider the fall, we notice in chapter 3 and verse 6 that it was Eve who was misled when the serpent in verse 4 and 5 conveyed his simple deduction concerning the trees of the knowledge of good and evil. Genesis 3 verse 4 And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die, for God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as Elohim, mighty ones, knowing good and evil. And so it seems to me that the serpent had deduced that it was desirable to understand good and evil. But secondly, that because the Elohim must have eaten from the same tree to gain their understanding of good and evil, and they were still alive, then surely Adam and Eve would also continue to live. We then find in verse 6, when the woman saw the lust of the eye, that the tree was good for food, and that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree to be desired to make one wise, she took the fruit thereof, and did eat, and gave also unto her husband with her, and he did eat. It is known that men and women, in the main, think differently. It's not entirely the case, but in the main. The, the different areas of the brains are interconnected and they are triggered differently. Women, in, you, you may say, in the main, tend to think more intuitively, more emotionally, sympathetically, rather than man. Whereas a man is often more logical and more reasoning, perhaps less sympathetic. And it seems to me that Eve made an emotional decision here, uh, more so than Adam would have. In 1 Timothy 2, I'll just quote it, and verse 14 confirms this conclusion. For it says, Adam was not deceived whilst Eve was. And therefore it's reasonable to my way of thinking to assume that Adam could have steered them both away from the situation. It also seems to me that Adam, as the head of the house, who had been given dominion over all the animals, ought to have had more control over the serpent, not permitting it to foot the freedom and opportunity to mislead his wife, he also ought to have ensured Eve was strong enough spiritually to perceive the dangers and the subtleties of the serpent. 
And if necessary, to avoid such a temptation by giving it a wide berth if she didn't feel strong enough to, he- to meet it head on. As the, sorry, the word touched in verse 3 can mean give it a wide berth. Don't even go anywhere near it can imply. It does seem touch wasn't part of the original law though. And she so added to the law. Perhaps something we ought to consider doing sometimes if we don't feel strong enough to resist something. But we do need to be very careful sometimes that we don't make it harder than it was intended or that we confuse what we've added with the reality of the, and the facts of the truth. I think we've got to be careful about adding to the law. Now if Eve was subject to Adam, surely she shouldn't have taken such a big step in taking the fruit without discussing it together with her husband, the head of the house, because it clearly would have affected both of them in a very big way. What a huge mistake, having such big consequences for them both and their offspring. It was essentially selfish of Eve, wasn't it? And it really, and it had really happened because she had, in her own mind, made Adam subservient to her mind, contrary to the father's will. Surely, as a couple in marriage, we ought to try and understand also our different abilities, which is perhaps at the root here. Our strengths, our weaknesses, and to amiably cooperate one with the other in love. For the mutual benefit of the truth, and ourselves, and Eve ought to have amiably left Adam to make the big decision, knowing that he was more able to rationalise the issues involved. And in a good marriage... It should never occur to a wife that she's been oppressed or ruled. Her submission should be entirely voluntary. And of course this is made easier for her if her husband leads appropriately in love. Just in the same way the ecclesia ought to submit to the, to the master. And the master led in love as he so evidently has for us. We know he loves us. We know his principles are good and true. And we naturally, with a free will love, wish to help. We wish to mirror him and comply with his wishes as his helpmate into eternity, God willing. And so Adam, verse 6, having become weaker in the relationship than he ought to have been, voluntary, knowing what he was doing, Understanding the consequences gave his life for his wife and voluntarily took the fruit from her so that he could be with her, supporting her, looking after her, keeping her company and her love. How sad it would seem that such big mistakes could be made by both and the consequences were so great for him, his wife and for his greater extended family. Of mankind. After taking the fruit, they felt naked. They were both equally responsible to the law, as they are in, as we are in the truth. The Elohim, Elohim asked, chapter three and verse eleven. Who has told thee that thou wast naked? Hast thou eaten of the tree, where I commanded thee that thou shouldest not? Again notice the order here. Adam is held to account before Eve. And it does seem that it was Adam who was told of the law. And that he passed it on to Eve. And in principle taught her. Both however were equally responsible for keeping the law. And both equally suffered as a consequence of not having done so. Notice they are rather pointedly addressed here as man. And woman, emphasising that Adam was taken out of the ground, while Steve was of man. 
Verse 12, notice how very wrongly both Adam and Eve try to shift the blame from one to the other instead of admitting to their own failure and responsibility. Like Adam and Eve, we will be judged by the master, by the things we say to him. And if we respond as they did, I personally do not believe that we'll be found acceptable. For, ex- for example, how could we imagine representing the Father with such an attitude? It was him. And yet be a righteous, just and merciful Elohim. Mighty ones. How, how can you be kings and priests after the order of Melchizedek when you're passing the blame in such a way? Just consider what Adam actually says. The woman thou gavest me. Oh, how quick he is to falsely blame both the Elohim and, the, and then the, the woman. Uh, but didn't the Elohim give the woman to him as a blessing? And so doesn't he effectively blame the Elohim and deride their God-given provision for him? How dangerous and ungrateful. Shouldn't he have tried to encourage and to build his wife's understanding the matter so that she didn't make such a mistake? He, He doesn't seem to have. And therefore it was Adam who hadn't lived up to his responsibility. And instead he goes on to blame her. She gave me of the tree and I did eat. And so quite wrongly, he brazenly lies, saying he didn't think the matter through, accepting her provision, sorry, proposition, when he shouldn't have done without thought. But that was in contrary to what 1 Timothy 2 and verse 14 says. He wasn't deceived. And so he must have thought it through. And he therefore lied. And when you think about it, it's these kind of things which cause the greatest troubles in marriages and in households. We should be absolutely honest and open with one another. Avoiding deceit, the smaller lies, the white lies you might see. The engineering of situations. Avoiding any form of deception. Living up to our respective responsibilities without passing the blame for failure on others. Because they do fundamentally undermine our trust and our respect for one another. And can cause horrendous rifts and problems in marriages and families. It's very important that we do respect our partners for trying honestly and faithfully in their responsibilities. But when they fall short, as we all do, encourage them. Lift them up for the next occasion. How often do we say we will do something we don't? Whilst we promise when our yea and our yea, our yea should be a yea and our nay is a nay. Keeping our word and more importantly our promises. I often wonder how we would feel if the father didn't keep his word. He changed it and he passed the blame for something on us. Verse 13, the woman is then challenged and she then blames the serpent. Without thought goes on to quickly admit she hadn't questioned or thought through uh, the serpent's suggestion. But she had, because she saw and desired the fruit. Perhaps she's more honest here though than Adam and was completely taken in. Verse 14, when it comes to the serpent, we find that whilst the serpent is not responsible to the law like Adam and Eve, he nevertheless suffers for misleading Eve. He would from then on crawl on his belly, on the ground, and eat the dust of the ground, which isn't without its significance, is it? In verse 16 through to verse 19, judgments of sorrow are passed on Eve and Adam, which we notice are made in reverse order. In verse 16, we find that the woman's sorrow was to be great 
equally multiplied. Whereas Adam's wasn't. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. Clearly refers to childbirth. It has been suggested that this might also include the ongoing emotional dependence she has in supporting her children for the rest of their lives, which is in some ways a vulnerability. Her desire or her longing would now be to her own her man or husband, and he shall have dominion over her. So her emotional and physical dependency on Adam would now become deeper and it would form part of her sorrow. Verse 17. And to Adam, because he had hearkened unto the voice of his wife rather than the father. Because of that, he would till the land in the sweat of his brow. And he would now provide for his wife and his family in the sweat of his brow. And it does seem in the main to me that he was made physically and emotionally stronger in order to perform that or provide that role of providing for his family. So we see the different roles and the dependencies are emphasised. Eve was to bear children and her desire would be to her husband. And so it would seem she was blessed with this warmer, softer nature that made her more sympathetic and more suited to the needs of supporting her husband and her children, helping her to raise her husband's family. Indeed, a wife can be and ought to be very influential in a quiet way, supporting her husband. We emphasise... Both roles in the wisdom of the Father were and are equally important, vital roles. But they are different. And when the roles are reversed and a woman attempts to be dominant, or a man is insipidly soft, and we see it, it surely shows us that we are, our natures are horribly contradicted. And we fail to bring the natural glory to the Father that he intended when he formed us. Let's go back now to our reading in First of Peter and chapter, chapter 3 and verse 1. Like ye wives, be in subject and to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, and therefore it could be someone who is in or out of the truth, it could be both, and they also may... They also may, without the word, be won by the conversation. That's the manner of life of the wives. Whilst they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear or respect. Verse 3 continues. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plaiting the hair or wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. Her focus was not to be on her beauty which mars with age. But verse 4, let it be the hidden man of the heart, in that which is not corruptible, even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the spirit of God, and of a faithful man, of great, and also of a faithful man, of great price. I think that's lovely. And notice it's something that Peter believes is essential, not optional. Just think a moment about our relationship with the Master. Would we ever contradict him? Would we subvert him? Argue with him? Be demanding? Be angry or throw a temper at him? I don't think so. So if we think our marriages in in the same way as we ought, then why would it occur to a sister to do the same with their husbands? Or even a brother in the truth? And it equally applies the other way for a brother with a sister, doesn't it? When we consider how the master (coughs) treats the ecclesia. I often think of the words of Proverbs 21 and verse 9 and 25 and verse 24 in respect of a man choosing the rooftop to a brawling woman. But I've seen it the other way around as well. In contrast, the words of Proverbs 25 and verse 11 are a lovely contrast. A word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver. It's never, it's important 
Never to let the sun go down without resolving our issues, particularly in a marriage. So we should never go to bed without resolving any difficulties between us. Talk openly and say goodnight lovingly. Marriage is a continual adjustment, but it should never be something you need to work at. I've heard it said it's hard work. It never was for me. It requires a fervent desire for both to help one another in the truth, to encourage one another in our spiritual well-being, being frank, honest, talking openly, nothing reserved, never engineering a situation, nothing hidden in our lives. There's nothing to betray. There's nothing to undermine it. It can, of course, be quite difficult for a sister to express concern about an issue with her husband or a brother, particularly perhaps when the brother is less capable. I've seen that in the particular respect. But while she still respects the roles and responsibilities of one another, it can be quite awkward. But surely there's always a way of expressing concern and issues that doesn't question the respective headship or, or the submission or question our roles that we have been blessed with by the Father. Colossians 4 and verse 6 um, says, Let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man Peter continues in chapter 3 and verse 5 for after this manner in the old time the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands even as Sarah obeyed Abraham Calling him, that means publicly, Lord. She called him Lord, openly and publicly. Whose daughters you are, as long as you do well in that respect. And are not afraid with any amazement. The inference of these words is that if a wife doesn't submit to a husband as Sarah did, they wouldn't be suitable for marriage with the master for eternity. Some very strong words, aren't they, brothers and sisters? 1 Timothy 2, verse 10 says, But which becometh women professing godliness with good works, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. Verse 12, But I suffer not a woman to preach, teach, nor to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. For Adam was first formed, then Eve. Of course, quoting from Genesis. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. And so there are two very good reasons why the sister should remain silent. Paul says some very similar words in Corinthians 14 and verse 34. I personally don't think the spiritual position, scriptural position of our sisters is demising in any way whatsoever. It's a lovely role that the Father has blessed them with. And personally I'm very glad. And I'm sure every brother thinks the same way, that we are very blessed to have such suitable companions. They are a provision of the Father, as we've read. To have the loving submission, the gentle cooperation in our homes, in teaching and bringing up our children, in the nurture and the admonition of the truth, when the husbands have to go out to work. It's a wonderful privilege that man can't normally do, just incapable in the same way. And I also believe we, can emphasize, we cannot emphasise enough how important it is for wives and sisters to go quietly in the spirit world. It's not the sole preserve of the husband. They ought to build themselves up so that they can help support and encourage both their husbands, their family, the ecclesia, in the things of the Spirit that can affect all 
their spiritual well, well, welfare. It's a huge responsibility and surely a wonderful privilege. Turn with me to Numbers chapter 6 and verse 1. There the law of the Nazarite demonstrates this very principle import very strongly. For verse 1 shows it could be taken by either a man or a woman. And that having a spiritual mind and rising to the spiritual heights is not limited to the brethren. Numbers chapter 6 and verse 5 deliberately contrasts the Nazarite with the high priest. There was to be no razor to come upon their head. Similarly with the priest, Leviticus 21 and verse 5. Numbers 6 and verse 5 says, He shall be holy, and they were to let their hair grow. Symbolically depicting the holiness to God as a crown, similar to the golden mitre of the priest of Leviticus 8 and verse 9, which had holiness of Yahweh written on it. Both donating a holy mind dedicated to the glory of the Father. Verse 6, number 6, verse 6 and 7 records how a Nazarite was to come near to it, not to come near to it, any dead body or a soul, not even for a close relative, which was the same for the high priest, Leviticus 21 and verse 10. Number 6 and verse 3, the Nazarite was to separate himself from wine and strong drink, which was the same for Aaron and his sons in the tabernacle, according to Leviticus 10 and verse 8. And so as verse 1 records, the Nazarite vow could be made and kept by either a brother or a sister. And both could rise to the greatest spiritual heights the law permitted in devotion and a commitment to the Father. How hugely sisters can provide or contribute to the ecclesia, encouraging other brethren and sisters that they don't that don't have support, sharing spiritual things with them, helping where perhaps the brethren haven't spotted a, sim a personal issue or a difficulty, or perhaps a brother doesn't have, have, uh, uh, have the nature to approach or even detect the matter. How important it is for the widow and the widowless the fatherless to be supported, visited if necessary, and provided a shoulder for those who would benefit from sharing some private things with them, discussing and encouraging our shared hope, enthusiasm, enthusing one another with a word and the current signs of the times, which clearly, clearly show that the return of the Master is near. Surely a sister can also help her husband entertain provide hospitability for those who are more in need than some of the others. Well, in conclusion, brothers and sisters, let's both, brothers and sisters, respect the order the Father has placed on us, respect the equal capacity we both have for understanding divine things, for us all to develop spirit minds and share in the prospects of God's plan of salvation. <coughs> we are different, and thankfully so. But let's appreciate and understand and respect one another's roles, our different abilities, our different capabilities, and learn to help one another in them to the mutual glory of the Father. Whilst the sister and wife should show submission to all brethren and their husbands, all brethren and sisters, all brethren and husbands also ought to respect their wives as the weaker vessel, forgiving and accommodating them in love, just as the master does and will do when he finally conveys his commitment to us at the judgment seat. The master understands whether his bride has a genuine love for him, or whether she is selfishly looking for what she can take from the relationship. To take being kings and priests for eternal life, for instance. He will know whether she is purely motivated 
by her love for him. And whether she is genuinely preparing herself for him in love. If not, I don't believe for one minute he will love us. And he will turn us away. Just as we would. If we do prepare ourselves properly. Which is God willing our subject next week. What a lovely hope we have. Which is not worthy to be compared with the present sufferings of this life.